You know, these past few weeks have really been challenging me um, regarding uh, the gathering, yeah, us coming together. There's restrictions out there. Um, rightly so, there's certain restrictions that are in place. And we've, um, uh, when, when the government said we had to shut down everything, okay, um, it wasn't an issue for me because I felt like, do you know what? Everyone's being treated equally. Everyone's being treated in the same way. Everyone's got to be shut indoors. We're all being shut away. It's cool. Like, they, I didn't have an issue with it. I didn't feel like there was any kind of like, oh, look what they're picking on the church. It wasn't. It was everybody was was uh, locked away for however long it was. Some For some, it was longer than others. Um, but we were locked away um, for a period of time. It was okay. Then the opportunity came to, to gradually come back into society with different things, shops opening and stuff like that. And we waited to see when the church could open again. And it was the 5th of July was the, the date that we had set for the church to open. And, um, and that was great. Again, for me, I was like, great, the church is opening. That's exciting. I can't wait for us to get together and do that. Um, but it seems to me that ever since then, everything else has stayed open. Everything else has been able to gather. Everything else has been able to do it except the church. Like, the church is, seems to be that there's a bunch of rules out there that seem to now be saying, like, the church can't gather, really. We got to the church can't sing. That was one of them. Um, there was another one saying, um, now it's, we all got to wear masks, which is why we're outside today. Because I thought, you know what, maybe people will be out there trying to, to look at whether the church is wearing their masks. And I thought, well, you can come to our church, but we'll be outside not wearing masks because that fits. I checked the law. We're okay. Okay. Um, but I just thought, you know what, it's starting to challenge me because it started to make me realize about our faith. So when we're running a church and it's all lovely and we can all sit in our seats in the right places and we can take our, you know, have the offering and sing our songs and we can clap and have a cup of tea after and, and whatever it is that you know, church looks like on a Sunday, then it all goes to kind of pretty much to plan. And then we all go home. And you just think, and we go through that process over and over again. That's what I was saying. Like, we've taken it for granted. We've taken that gathering for granted. But now it's kind of saying like, actually, like we're coming to a place where it ain't persecution on the level of what the church faces around the world, the underground church, nowhere close to it. People would lose their lives. In China, if you're a Christian, full stop, you're getting arrested right now. Churches are being burnt down and, and removed. Um, so, so we're not comparing ourselves to that, le that level whatsoever. But, but for the first time probably in our lifetime in this nation as Christians, we are being challenged to say, what are we going to do with our faith? What, how are we going to stand for our faith? And, and, and what does it actually... Um, What's the cost actually going to be? Are we willing to actually pay the cost if there is a cost? And we talk about it, don't we? We say like, well, you know, I said this, I think last week. Oh, if someone came in and they, they had a gun and they said, renounce Jesus. I'll be like, yeah, I'll, I'll be first in line. You know, I don't care. But we say that. But actually, now that we're in it, where's the church? Now that there actually there's a challenge for the church to gather. Do you know the government have said that the church can open its doors? Do you know that? Like, that's, that's the, the government said the church can be open, and yet the church's doors are shut. So many churches' doors are closed, and I don't understand it. Do you know what? And this isn't us puffing us up, because we're not, I'm here to try and say, like, you should know us by now. We feel pretty inadequate about ourselves. We, we look at ourselves first before we look at anything else. But the reality is, do you know when we started planning to open the church up? I'll tell you when. The day we were told that the doors were being shut. As soon as the doors were shut, we were already planning for when they were going to be open again. We were already looking for when we could gather again. Like, when's that going to happen? What's the date? I even bought a video out about May time thinking it was going to be really soon, and it was still another two months away. We were already thinking, like, well, when the doors open, are we ready for it? And we did a lot of things around the church to get it physically ready. But the government have said the church can open the church the government has said that the church can actually gather in numbers more than 30 inside their buildings and no one's actually doing it and i don't understand that it's actually really confused me and it's actually made me really sad because i thought when i was going through this process of lockdown that that was god taking me out of my comfort zone putting me into a place where i felt um a bit like oh no I'm not be able to do what I used to do. We can't just go to church. We can't just do those things uh, that we normally would do. But now it's just me and God. Me and God in the house. Me and God in the, my living room. Me and God on, on my own here. Whatever it might be. Now I've got to address my relationship with God. And for the last four or five months, I thought 
that this was God's way of grabbing hold of you guys, grabbing hold of me, grabbing hold of the church in this nation, and actually getting us all together to say, right, come on, let's get our act together, because for the first time ever in your life, unless you're, unless you're around in the war, you, you actually aren't able to gather and worship me. And that, I'm taking that comfort zone away from you. Now, I want to focus you to focus on your personal relationship with me. So I thought that the church in these last five months was actually just focusing on their relationship with God, strengthening the areas they need to strengthen, dealing with the things they need to deal with, so that when the doors open, we were ready to just reach this world that's in desperate, desperate need of God. Like the world is, we went out on the streets yesterday. We went and evangelized out on the streets yesterday. And do you know what? It wasn't as scary as we thought. And we actually came out of it unscathed. There was no police. There was no one turned up. We got to sing. We got to preach. We got to speak to people. We got to hand out things because we felt like we needed to start being a voice in this time because people are looking for answers. And the ones that actually have the answers, the church, are actually shut. And we've got to start doing this. this and this is talking to all Christians. We need to start realizing, like, hang on a minute. We need to start thinking, what, what is this all about? Did I get saved to go to church? Did I get saved to go through a religious system? Is that what, is that what we're here? I might, I might say because I'm British, whatever it might be, it sh- we should have been shaken up in this time. And it made me realize, and I'm talking about myself in this time as well, wow, if it really came down to it, what cost, what am I willing to pay the cost? Do you know that if the police wanted to today, they could still do it, they could turn up and potentially arrest me because we're gathering together and worshiping and singing. Am I willing to pay that cost? That's what's been playing around in my head for two weeks. Um, is it, are we actually going to do this? Even the fact that we sing, like, we're not really meant to be doing that. But I, I'm sorry, I'd rather be put in jail I'd rather than, than be told I can't worship God. I'm not, I'm not, I'm scared about it. I'm not like, oh, just bring it on. I don't want it to happen. But I want to say to you, but how can I be a, a genuine in my faith and preach to you guys and say, put your hope in God, trust in God, do all these things, all the preachers that you could pull out if you wanted and say, Rich, uh, you said this on this date. It's all there. It's all on YouTube, unfortunately, for me, for you to pick out whatever you want. And so, so to me, if I'm saying that to you, then this is my test as a church leader to say, well, hang on a minute. When the opportunity comes for us to make a stand, no matter how much the cost may be, am I willing to actually put my money where my mouth is and actually say, well, actually what I do say I am going to do, or are we going to actually just hide? And, and, I'm, I, and it's really, really challenged me because it is scary. I have a family. I have a house. You know, I have things to maintain. I've got things to look after. And yet, my faith in Christ, I believe in it. I believe in it. I believe in what he's done for me. I believe he paid a greater cost for me than I could ever repay. And therefore, me making a stand for him is nothing compared to the stand he's made for me. And if I'm telling you guys to sacrifice, surrender, and whatever it may be in your life, I've got to come to that place. So when I'm saying it about Christians and church, don't think I'm getting angry at the church generally. I'm getting angry at myself. I'm challenging myself. Like, where am I at in my faith? Because if we're not going to meet just because we even have to wear a mask, what's that about? I'm not saying, like, it's up to you whether you do it or not. But we can still gather. We can still meet. We can still pray for each other. We can still meet. The building can be open. Do you know, we've had about 20 new faces walk through this door in the four weeks that we've been open because we were open. And if we weren't open, those faces wouldn't come here. There are new faces here today. I don't even know you. Welcome. Hello. Um, but, like, you're very welcome. But I don't, I don't know you. But I'm pretty sure if we weren't open, you wouldn't be here. That would be, unless you just, it would be weird, wouldn't it, if you were here? Um, if we weren't open. Because we're open, there's an opportunity for people to gather and worship. Just a question, was today the first time that you got to worship in the gathering for a long, long time? Amen. Yeah? Did you enjoy that? Did you miss it? I'm sorry. We've got to keep doing it. We've got to keep doing it until until we can't. <laughs> whatever, that look, whatever that means. <laughs> Hopefully Jesus comes back. Um, but... Um, we keep going and we keep proclaiming God. This is a really long intro. Anyway, so I was, I was just seeking a scripture and I thought, oh God, like, what's the scripture that I need to get hold of and encompass, like, what I think I need to do, what I need to act like, how I need to be as a Christian in my life? What is it that, that um, is there a scripture out there? And I found this scripture and, um, and it's a really amazing passage. It's a whole chapter and it's written in the message. The reason it's in the message is just because it's worded in a certain way. But I've looked at the other 
What's it called? The other versions, and it's, it's the same. It's pretty good. But it's just worded in a way that we can sort of read it and think, wow, that's taken on board. So I'm going to ask you guys just to read it with me um, as we go through. So in verse um, 1 to 2, I didn't mean you have to read it out loud with me, but just read it, follow me along. So in verse 1 to 2, it says, since God has so generous, the sun's coming out. Oh, I'm getting hot. Um, since God has so generously let us in on what he is doing. Since God has so generously let us in on what he is doing. Just a quick question. Aren't you thankful that God let you in? Yeah? I'm thankful that God let me in. I'm so thankful that God let me in. But, but he doesn't just let you in to his life. He's let you in on his plans. How incredible is that? Like, God isn't just saying, oh, yeah, just come and be part of, of my fold. He's saying, now, come and be part of this. Be part of my family. Now, let me show you my plans that I want you to get involved in. He, he wants you to be involved. This is what I love. This is the thing that's aggravated me about the church. The church, for me, I think I probably believe in the church more than anyone else on this planet because I believe that God set it up. God, Jesus died on the cross, and then he left, yeah, Jesus left, and he left that message in, in, and the hope of that message in you lot, in us. He left it in us. Why are we following Jesus today? Why are you even here? Because 2,000 years ago, people got given that message. Jesus left, and he said, I'm off, but you are going to carry on my message. And people have faithfully continued to pass on the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the last 2,000 years that somehow it reached you, and you are here today because of it. Jesus put his hope in you lot to share his gospel, to share his truth. That's why I believe in the church more than anything, because it's part of God's plan. Has the church screwed up a lot of things? Yes. Has it, has it been manipulated and manipulated people in history? Yes. But it's still God's plan, and when we get hold of it in the right way, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And we need to start realizing that. We need to start understanding that, that this is what this is saying. That he has gener generously let us in on what he's doing is the church. He's generously let you be part of his plan. Now let's go execute it. Let's go and put it into, into fruition. Let's go and see it happen. Let's go be active with our faith. We're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into occasional hard times. We're not going to throw up our hands in surrender and say, oh, I can't do this anymore, and walk off because we run into occasional hard times. Maybe churches aren't meeting today because maybe the legislation, maybe the rules, maybe the, 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 the paperwork is too much. But that to me is not that big a deal of a hard time to me. Let's just gather. Let's get together. Let's face the consequences afterwards. That's what I think. But, oh, I needed a form, did I? Oops. Okay. I was going to say, are there any quitters in the house? But that's a bit negative, isn't it? And we're not a negative church. So I looked at the word quitter, and I thought, what's the opposite of a quitter? So this is what it's saying. It says, we're not about to throw up our hands, so we're not, we're not quitters. But then I thought, well, what's the opposite? And it's actually really hard to find out. But it said go-getters. I thought that was all right. But this one, fireballs. Fireballs. And I thought, yeah, that's us. That's us. Because what it means is that we, we're not going to quit. We're actually going to go in and we're going to cause a fire. That we're going to enlight what's going on around us. So when we hit the hard times, which is right now, church, yeah, what we're going through right now, the, the, the lockdowns, the, the illnesses, that is, the virus that's around the world, all the financial struggle that's going on, the riots that are happening, everything is going on right now. It's a hard time, and it's a hard time maybe individually for you. Maybe you are affected by certain, some of those certain things. But if you become the fireball that God's created you to be, the world will take note. The world will look at you and go, well, hang on a minute. You're facing the same things I'm facing. You're, you're struggling with the same things I'm struggling with, and yet you're pushing through, and you're going, you're not quitting, you're pushing through. And the world is looking for that hope. It's looking for that fire. It's looking to be ignited. And that's our responsibility, church. Our responsibility is to set this world on fire for Jesus. It's for us to get hold of this amazing gospel that we've received ourselves, and then just go and get that little, tiny, little bit of spark, and just throw it into the woods and then let it uh, uh, just catch fire and let their people 
let people just get hold of what we've already been able to get hold of in our lives. The church is looking for it. We're talking about hard times. We're in them. We're in them right now. The world is in them right now. But the world is looking for the fireball, not the quitter. What one are you? Fireball. <laughs> I'm a fireball. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought the, word, the word is funny, isn't it? But fireballs. Okay, the next line, it says, we refuse to wear masks and play games. No one's wearing it. Where's anyone wearing a mask today? You're all wearing masks. We're live. Well done for wearing all your masks, everyone. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we refuse to wear masks and play games. Now, this is not, this is a spiritual talk, okay? This is not me. Let's not get too political. This is not me saying, throw your masks in the bin, burn them, you know? This is about, about us. We're refusing to wear masks. We're refusing to, to bow the knee to the things of, of, of the enemy, the things that, that, that turn us away from God. We're refusing to wear a mask, which is actually covering up who we really are. Turn to the person next to you and say, are you wearing a mask? Today's title is Taking Off Your Mask. The title of the sermon is Taking Off Your Mask. Now, this is a message predominantly for the church. The lockdown has proven that the church has been wearing a mask for too long. That's what it's proven to me. That's what it's shown me is actually all my expectation and hope in, in, in the church just coming out of its doors um, or, or its lockdown and just being like, right, let's just get Britain. Let's just go for it has been literally put out with a bucket of water within just weeks. I thought, okay, the church is coming together. Here we go. Here, like we've had the lockdown. We've been waiting in our wilderness experience. We did that sermon, didn't we, where we understood that we were going through that wilderness experience. That quarantine time was a time like Jesus went through those 40 days and 40 nights preparing him for ready to go. And then I thought, here we go. The church is at the starting blocks and the doors can open. And then I just realized and I found out that the, the church isn't even going to open its doors. And I don't understand it. I don't understand it. So it makes me realize that the church is wearing a mask. That the Christian is wearing a mask. It's not wearing one that says, like, I'm a Christian and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand by what the word of God says. It's actually saying, I'm a Christian. But if it conflicts with what's in the, in the in, um, society, if it makes me unpopular, um, if, if, it, if it constructs fear, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm not going to completely um, go, go down that route. So the word of God says it. But we're going to kind of compromise on the word of God. We've got to start taking off our masks that are hiding who we are in our faith. We've got to stop wearing these masks that's that, that are be, we've been masked for too long in our religion, in our Britishness, in our, in our just going to church every Sunday, whatever it might be. And we've got to break from that and we've got to say, right, the mask needs to come off. The mask needs to come off. I want to challenge you today that now is the time for the church to rise up. We sang it. There's an army rising up. And become what it's created to do. Be a light in the darkness, a voice in the silence, and a hand of action where injustice prevails. That's what the church needs to be. I'll say that again. We need to be a light in the darkness, a voice in the silence, and a hand of action where injustice prevails. The church needs to be seen now more than ever. This is our window of opportunity just to show that there is hope. That when we go around and we say there is a hope, there is, a, there is peace that you can have. There is salvation you can have. That when we say it with our words, we actually mean it with the actions of our lives and how we live our lives. The other way that we can wear a mask is that, that there are people in the Bible that, Jesus, that God changed the name of. I need to get a peg. Holy Spirit, stop it. Come on. Okay. God also wants to change your name. God wants you to go from wearing your mask. He wants you to remove your mask. God changed the names of some people in the word of God. He changed their status. He changed where they were. And he, and he, and he changed through just changing their name. It ended up being where they ended up, where, where they ended up going to. For example, there is Abram. He was a man that could not have a son. Sarai, Sarai was a baron. Um, and they were changed into Abraham and Sarah. So they went from being people that could not have children to being labeled Abraham and Sarah, which actually means the mother and the father of nations. 
God wants to take you in your barrenness right now, whatever that is for you, whatever emptiness you've got, whatever seems to not be working, whatever doesn't seem to be producing fruit, God wants to say, I, wanna, I want you to take off your mask and I want you to start following me. I want you to let me change your name that the word Christian actually will mean what it means, which is to be like Christ. I want to change your status, that you're not, you're not someone that goes to church, but you're someone that is the church, that you actually live out your faith. Jacob is another one. He is someone who was living in the shadow of someone else's life. Maybe you live in the shadow of, of other things, the things around you, people around you. Maybe, you're, 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 maybe you're, your faith isn't maybe even your own. Maybe you're just here because other people go to church. God wants to change your status. He wants it to be personal for you. He doesn't want it to be a religious thing. He doesn't want it to be a British thing. He doesn't want you to be here just because it's something you've done since you were five years old. He wants you to have a personal relationship with him. Jacob wrestled um, God, and then God changes his name to Israel, which means he went from being a man um, that was in the shadow of others, and actually a deceptive man is actually what it means, and actually he went to a man known as a man that was an overcomer. Who wants to be an overcomer today? God wants to change your status. He doesn't want you to be in that place where you're just, you're just living in the shadow he wants you to be an overcomer today. Simon was a fisherman, and he wasn't a very good fisherman either if you read the Bible. There's two times he's catching fish, and both times he doesn't catch any. He's a fisherman, but Jesus meets him, and he says, I'm going to call you Peter. And then what does he make him? He makes him a fisher of men. He changes the status. I want to say that God wants to do that to every single believer on this planet. He wants to take our status of just being a very poor fisherman, a very a poor a person that's just following the way of society, and he wants to turn you into people that will fish for people, that will reach others, people that will that you would live a life that's not looking at your situation, focusing on what you want to do, but you're actually realizing this incredible faith that has been put on you isn't for you, but it's for someone else. He wants to turn you into fishers of men. I want to say that maybe you're wearing a mask today. Maybe you are in that place, but God is brilliant at changing our status, changing our name. When I was younger and I walked into the church, I walked in a non-believer. I didn't think about God really at all in my life. I just got invited um, too many times that in the end I thought I'd just go to shut the guy up. I went to church and it changed my life forever in that instant God can do that for you today. Wherever you're at in your life, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever status you think you are, maybe you do feel like, man, God, am I really willing to pay the, cro the cost in my relationship with you? I want to do that. I want to do that. God can change that in you today. Going back to the scripture, we do not maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. And we do not twist God's word to suit ourselves. Amen? We do not twist God's word to suit ourselves. We do not try and make it work for our society or so that we can sin in a particular way or that we can do something that we want to do. We stick to the truth of what it says. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open. That's us today, isn't it? Look at us. Out in the open. The whole truth on display so that those who want to can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. I want to say to you, do not let anyone tell you that your actions do not affect others. Your actions affect others, positive and negative. How you conduct your faith, how you walk out your faith in Christ, people are looking at you right now, and they're looking at you, and they're saying, right, that person, is." A, they say they go to church, or that person says they're a Christian. All eyes are on you. Now, don't get me wrong. We talk about this a lot. We're human. We fall short. And we'll get to that in a minute. But do not let anyone say to you that your actions, good or bad, do not affect others. They do. Be aware of that. When you start saying, I'm a follower of Christ, people take note. People are looking. People are pay paying attention. And it says here that then they can see and judge for themselves the presence of God through whether you're following the word or not. That's a big, big, um, I've got a word, responsibility, thank you. Big responsibility on us, but it's a responsibility nonetheless that exists for those that are followers of Christ. 
I'll say this. It's not our responsibility to save people. We're not that church. But to lead them to the one that saves. Amen? It isn't our responsibility to save people. It isn't our responsibility to even change people's minds or get them to to believe what you believe. But it's our responsibility to point them to the one that does. Verse 3 and 4. If our message is obscure to anyone, it's not because we're holding back in any way. Amen? If it doesn't make sense to people, tough. Because actually we've done everything we should have done. I've lived how I should live. I've tried my best. Um, You know, um, Ian says, he's just saying, give God your best. Pray it's blessed. And Jesus takes care of the rest. Yeah, we can only give our best. We can't give perfection. We can't we can't go down a route of saying like we need to look like this or tick all these boxes. We can just be in our personal relationship with God. You know and I know when we walk with him, what we give and what we don't give, what we do and what we don't do. So just before God, you know what you need to do. And we don't need to be a people that actually um, put too much pressure on ourselves to be like the person next to you or be like the people up here or be like anything else. Be you. Be who God's called you to be. Be the one that God's, God's set you apart to be. Follow him. Listen to him. But if you do those things, your message will be a bit peculiar to those people. It says that we're a peculiar people. It says that we're a bit odd. It says that sometimes God takes the the strange things of this world to confuse the wise. And and that's us. That's you lot. Who's strange? Yeah. Yeah. And God wants to take you, and, he, and if you read the word of God, he, he, he takes, have you noticed that Jesus didn't say, right, I'm going to the, the, the Jewish biblical college or university or whatever to recruit? In fact, there's a passage in the Bible that talks about that, where they actually thought that Jesus was going to the certain area to recruit all the people to follow him. Who did Jesus pick? Fishermen, tax collectors, people that people hated, people that were the lowest of society. David was the lowest in his family. Gideon was the lowest of the lowest of the lowest by his own admission. God picks these amazing people. Moses was a murderer. I want to say to you today, if you feel unqualified, good. You are, you are qualified by being unqualified. That's who God picks. That's who God picks. Just live your life in a su- such a way people will take note. And if they don't take note, it says no. No, it's because these other people are looking or going the wrong way and refuse to give it serious attention. All they have eyes for is the fashionable God of darkness. They think he can give them what they want and that they won't have to bother believing a truth they can't see. They're stone blind to the day spring brightness of the message that shines with Christ, who gives us the best picture of God we'll ever get. (laughs) Church, if you do not hold back, if you give all you have and you do your best to point to Jesus, that's all you can do. But what I love about this passage is it actually speaks about the fact that we sometimes can beat ourselves up. Anyone beat themselves up because you think you haven't, you made mistakes in preaching the gospel? That maybe like sometimes you think, oh, I should have done more. Maybe I should have drove them more. Maybe I should have given them more money. Maybe I should have, maybe I should have like, um, you know, spoke a lot, lot more to them about Jesus. Maybe I should have done more and more and more. It says that actually a lot of these people that we speak to, as long as you're doing what God is asking you to do, is actually saying to them, some of them have already got their mind fixed on doing what they want to do. It ain't your fault. If people have come into the church and you've preached the gospel, the truth, and they've left, it ain't on you. It's on them. And actually it says that they were already set themselves up to go down that route anyway. It was already a losing battle. Does that mean we stop preaching the gospel? No, we keep going. We keep going. Because one day, they might end up with someone like you, where someone preached the gospel to you and you said yes. And that's why we do it. Our motto in our church is that we do everything to the best of our abilities. Our mission statement, we do everything to the best of our ability that we might just reach that one. That's our mission statement. We're not looking for a mega gathering. We're not looking to fill the church up with loads of bodies. We're just looking to reach that one life at a time. If people do not respond to you, it ain't on you. So many Christians feel guilty because other, uh, others refuse Jesus, but Scripture says right here, these people are looking to do it their way and refuse to give Jesus any serious attention. 
It ain't on you. Turn to the person next to you. Oh, yeah. It says about not holding back. It's about not holding back. It's about going for it in your faith and not holding back. I want to say to you, turn to the person next to you and say, I ain't holding back. I didn't believe that. I don't think that person even believed it. <laughs> I ain't holding back. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I am. Do you want to try and say it like you mean it, or are you just not feeling it today? Do you want to try again? Yeah? Turn to the person next to you and say, I ain't holding back. I ain't holding back. Five and six. Remember our message is not about ourselves. We're proclaiming Jesus Christ, the master. All we are is messengers, errand runners from Jesus for you. It started when God said, light up the darkness and our lives filled up with light. And we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. If you only look at us, this is the disclaimer. If you only look at us, you might miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in adorned, unadorned clay pots of ordinary lives. Yeah? Isn't that us? Isn't that us? That we are just walking around in our ordinary lives. And that means, it says here, that's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. Yeah? That is to stop anyone else getting confused that it's about you. Yeah? So God makes sure that he puts his power in your, I was going to say ugly, that's a bit harsh, but in what you've got right now, your shell that you have. That's a polite way of saying it. God puts it in you. He puts it in you so that people can see the power of God through you, knowing it has nothing to do with you. Knowing that we run our weaknesses, knowing that we have struggled just like everyone else struggles. It's not about our, ourselves. We're errand runners for Jesus, for people. That's our responsibility. It's not about you. It's about him. We do not live for him to point to us, but we live for him so that we can point to him. When people look at us, that we can point to him. The world is looking for answers. I'm afraid it ain't you. It ain't you, but it's him in you and how you conduct and how you live your life and how we start being the light in the darkness as a church will point to him. Do you know more challenging than living a life that's not holding back is living a life that ain't about you? That's a big challenge, isn't it? Uh, one, one way you put a lot of effort, a lot of time, and you do a lot of things, and you end up in a place where you end up actually not getting any glory for it. You think, my God, I put so much effort in, so much time. You don't know what we did. You don't know money that we spent. You don't know what we did. God's like, I know everything, mate. I know, what I, I know everything, but I've done it through you so that the glory, the glory would be seen, and he would only get the glory. There's no glory in this for us. Are we willing to do that? So we throw everything into our relationship with God and we get no glory for it. Are you willing to live that life? Are you willing to live that life? I was challenged this week because I was thinking about what could go wrong, what the, what the enemy could throw at us, what, what, all, all that kind of stuff. And I thought, there's a guy called David Wilkinson. I don't know if you know him, but he, he, um, <laughs> He was called by God to go and reach um, a gangs in New York. And he went and did it in such a way that he went into the courthouse. He was so bold in his faith. He went in there and he said, he said, um, I want to speak to the judge because I need to speak to the judge on behalf of God. God wants to speak to them. And, all, and, and so he goes into the court case, courthouse. He, he bursts in there. He goes to speak to the judge. The judge says, you need to stop talking. Like, stop talking, otherwise I'll, you'll be in trouble. He won't stop talking. He keeps trying to press his point because he thinks he's doing what God wants him to do. And then what happens is he ends up in a place where, um, as he's leaving, he gets kicked out of the courtroom. Um, they basically arrest him, and they're taking him out of the courthouse. This is a big case that's going on about some kids that had murdered another kid in New York. So it was on the front pages of everything. And then he ends up getting a picture taken as he's leaving the um the courthouse, and, he, and they actually say, would you hold your Bible up? He wasn't really thinking. He holds his Bible up. And then it was on the front page of the newspaper the next day saying, um, um, like, crazy, crazy preacher breaks into courthouse and disturbs this, this case and all this kind of stuff. And um, 
he goes back to his church. So he went there. He, he was at another church. He was running. He went back to his church, and they were said, please don't ever do anything like that ever again. And, um, and he was in shame, and he was embarrassed. Even his wife was like, what were you thinking? And it's on the front page of all the newspapers. And, um, and he just thinks, wow, by making a stand for God, by doing what we think we should do for God, it seems to go really, really wrong. And then what, what happens is he, he ignores his church. He feels like he should go back to New York. He goes back to New York. He's with a friend this time. And he's just driving through um, New York. And he feels God say, stop here. Stop here. Get out of the car. He gets out of the car. He walks around the corner. And uh, um, someone taps him on the shoulder, shoulder and says, Davy, Davy. And he turns around and he's like, hi, I don't know who you are. And he says, you're the preacher. You're Davy. And he, that gave him the access to the gangs that God had called him to because he stepped out in obedience to do what God did. And even though it was bad press in one way, it wasn't because it actually opened the door for God to do what he wanted to do. And that's what hit me the most is actually if we get bad press as a church, it can be good. God can turn it for good. God can use it. We just got to be obedient to do what God's asking us to do. And I just want to challenge you in that. That's what I've been challenged by. I'm ever always preaching to you guys about what I'm being challenged with. Are we really going to live out our faith? Are we really going to live it out? Because in this country, it's been too comfortable for too long. We said it, we said it before. People out there are looking for hope. They're looking for something, but they're looking at the church and thinking, I don't see it. I don't get it. Like they, they look more bored than we do. They look more fed up than we do. They, they look more miserable than we do. And it's time, it's time for us to actually make that stand. It's time for us to start showing like, no, we, we, we should be the most radical people on the planet. We should be the most lively people on the planet. We should be the ones that are, are going into a room and changing the atmosphere because Jesus is in you. We should be those people. And I just want to challenge us that now is the time. It's not like wait any longer. Don't think, oh, I'll wait until I see what the government say. Now is the time. The world is looking for answers. The world wants to know, is there more than this? And the answer is yes. And the church has that answer. And yet we're not actually telling anyone with it. We're not actually showing it to anyone. And it's time that we start to be it. I don't want to be a hypocrite anymore. I don't want to be someone that says it and doesn't do it. We need to start living a life where we start living for Christ properly, fully, and that we're willing to pay the price, whatever the price is. I'm trusting God. I'm going to trust God that no matter what the enemy wants to throw at us, God will still turn it for good. And that, and that can I really, really mean that? And the answer is yes. We went out on the streets yesterday. I was really worried about going out on the streets yesterday. But the reality of it was, do you know what? We need to go out. We need to show the truth. And what happened when we went out? People were like, thank you so much for coming out. Christians were coming up to us going, it's about time someone did. People were coming up to us. People, were, We were able to pray with people that we wouldn't have got prayed for. We were able to share the gospel with people that wouldn't have had the gospel shared with them. We did not know what God's going to do with that. But we just were there. There was, by turning up, Lives can change. By not turning up, nothing changes. Yeah? Show up. Turn up. Let's start being active in our faith. I know this is a bit of a heavy message, but I've been really angry this week in myself, like challenged in myself, but angry looking at the church. I was, I was, um, someone, another minister was telling me that he had a, a Zoom message with a load of people, and they said, oh, we're not opening until, no, they didn't even say they're opening, they said they were going to meet in September to talk about whether we're going to open. I'm like, even if, even if the government shut us all down again, at least you could be open for two months. Do something with this. It's a great weather. Use it. Use the opportunity. Get a barbecue going. Do whatever. There are so many ways you can work around the social distance and stuff and still preach the gospel. And the church wants to go on holiday or stay on holiday. Been on holiday for five months. It's really infuriated me. It's upset me. Because it just made me. I heard another one say, someone said, apparently that they're going to keep they feel that the numbers on, on their web, on the YouTube were so good that they weren't as good as the number. Um, they were so good that they were better than the numbers they were good physically in the building. So they're going to carry on doing. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That's forsaking the gathering together. This is virtual church. It's not real church. Did it serve a purpose? Yes. Does it serve a purpose? When, like, we're doing live stream now. Hello, everyone. We're doing live stream now because we were doing live stream for a year before we even went into lockdown because we felt it was important to make sure we looked after our family when they were sick, when they weren't able to get here, that they could still be part of the meetings. That's what it should be there for, where we can reach people that maybe can't get here, physically get here, or whatever reason it is, or people maybe in, round, in parts of the world that maybe can't even get to church. We want to be there for them. But other than that, 
We do not forsake the gathering together. We need to gather together. We need to be around each other. We need to pray for each other. A, a week ago, or just over a week ago, we met here. We had um, we had a uh, a prayer meeting outside, and we had a fire pit, and we saw like over 40 people turn up for that, for a prayer meeting outside. And I thought, wow, isn't it great to see the church actually turning up? Isn't it great to see us together? And we need to keep that going, church, because the world is looking in, and people were turning up, and people were, even we had a, even had a little bit of trouble, which is always good. If you get a bit of trouble on the outside, it because the enemy hates what's going on on the inside. And I want to encourage you today that we need to start start showing the world that there is this hope, there is this incredible salvation that they can have, but it's through us, you. It's through you. Where was I? It's not about you, that's it. Um, we've been surrounded and battered by troubles. Anyone been surrounded and battered by troubles? Amen. But we're not demoralized, amen? Oh, okay, maybe you still are. Okay. Um, we're not sure what to do, but we know God knows what to do, amen? Yeah. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. Amen? We've been thrown down, but we've not been broken. Amen. What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Trial, torture, mockery, murderer. What Jesus did among them, um, he does in us. He lives. Our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. You want to know why we need to make a stand in the midst of persecution, in the midst of of. of of being told that we can't do certain things that contradict or go against what the Word of God says we should do, it's because then Christ will be evident in you because people will look at you and go, wow, they actually really believe what they say. They really believe what they say. Look at them. And people might think you're deluded. They might think you believe in a fairy tale. They might think all those things, but they'll respect you much more if you live it out and you stand for what you're saying. I love this. Well, we're going through the worst. You're getting in on the best. Verse 13 and 15. We're not keeping this quiet. Not on your life. Amen? This ain't my words. This is in the Bible. We're not keeping this quiet. Not on your life. Just like the psalmist who wrote, I believed it. So I said it, we say what we believe, and what we believe is that the one who raised up the master Jesus will just as certainly raise us up with you alive. Every detail works to your advantage and to God's glory. More and more grace, more and more people. Amen? Don't want to see more and more people coming into the kingdom. I do. More and more praise. We ain't shutting up. We're praising God. We're lifting his name. I want to say, what is it that you believe? Do we want to do what we believe? Do we want to actually follow through with it? Or, or do we just want to read the words on the page and make it sound like we're holy, but actually not live it? Let's start living out this life. Let's start living out what God's called us to be. Maybe for the first time ever in your faith, and I'm putting my hands up to this as well, Maybe this is starting to look a little bit more like the picture these guys started to face. And it's only slightly, slightly. It's that we're not being murdered for our faith. Not in this country. But maybe, just maybe, we're starting to be challenged in our faith. Is it really real? Are we actually standing on the word of God? Are we willing to pay the price? Are we willing to actually make the stand when asked to make the stand? Are we willing to actually do that? And maybe for the first time, ever we talked about this we talk about the times that are coming the end times we talk about all those things but maybe this is the start of something where it's starting to look like for the first time the church is actually being challenged about their faith and the world is taking note and the world is looking because i'm wondering what they think when they say oh the churches are shut in because that's what's being said isn't it well the churches can do this but not that i wonder what the world is thinking when boris says that i wonder if they're thinking oh that's that's interesting. I wonder what the church is going to do about that. What are we going to do about it? How are you going to conduct yourself, not just in a church setting like today where we're gathering, but when you're out, when you're walking with people, when you're um, at work, when you're with your family? 
How do they see you? Do they see fear or do they see peace? That doesn't make any sense that Jesus has put in you. Are we staying quiet? Verse 16 to 18, nearly there. So we're not giving up. No? Brilliant. How could we? That's the question. How could we give up on Jesus? How could we even have the thoughts to think that we just can just do what we want with this incredible faith that he's given us? How could we? How could we turn our backs on him when he never turned his back on us? How could we? That's what he's saying. We ain't giving up because it, it shouldn't even be in our brains. That when, the, when it comes to it, when the question is asked of us, what are we going to do with it? That the answer is, whatever Jesus is asking us to do is what I'm going to do. The message a few weeks back was what he said. That's what we need to go with. We're going with what he said. Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Praise God for his grace, yeah? Thank you, God, that we are not here because we're self-righteous, not here because we can do it in our own strength, not here because, um, because we, we ticked all the right boxes and we've done it all and we made it. We're here because you did it. You paid the price and you, you made it possible for us. No one else. There's no other way. It ain't about us. It's all about what you've done for us. Listen to this. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times. These times right now that you may be struggling with in your faith, to show your faith, are nothing in comparison to the incredible life that we have ahead. The lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today and gone tomorrow. But the things we can't see now will last forever. Hi guys, thanks for watching this video. Please go and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please um, go and like our Facebook page and please share um, this video with your friends and your family. Um, let the world know more about who Jesus really is. Thanks guys.